lights, camera, action. On this week's show, we have the hugely talented drum and bass um, record producer and is an absolute beast on the wheels of steel. We have the one and the only Nikki Black Market in the place. How you doing, my man? <laughs> lovely, lovely. Thanks for having me. How you doing, mate? You good? Yeah, all good. All good. It's just a weird, like, weird times, I've got to admit. Absolute weird times, but um, we got to pull together. We got a there's a light at the end of the tunnel. There always is, um, and we got to go through. We got to go through to that light. Hundred percent, mate. We have got to remain positive. I mean, I, I'm a I'm a London black cab driver. I drive a black cab in London, so London's a ghost town. My uncle, mo- yeah, my uncle used to have a, a black cab. Um, late sixties. He started. I think he started late sixties late 60s, early 70s. Obviously, it's a lot different now with all the one ways and, oh, and you've, got, you've got to you've got to learn about the engine and all kinds of things now with the with the yeah with and, and you know it's a, it's, a, it's a lot more it's a lot more pressure with you know we've got the cycle lanes the e scooters that are coming in yeah. now so you've got to have eyes. Let me ask you. Let me ask you. How long did it take you to to learn the knowledge? To pass it t- t- took me four years. Yeah. Yeah, it wouldn't surprise me nowadays. Yeah, and four, yeah. you know, three to four years is a, is an average. I mean, the longest it's taken yeah. someone is eighteen years to pass. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, and there's only there's only like um, I think it's like about a twenty twenty five percent pass rate. It's it's absolutely gruesome. Yeah. You know, it's it's Can a. Can I host- ask you how many t- how many attempts did you have? I was up there, uh, well, it's an ongoing attempt. So you keep going back for appearances until you, you know, until you basically, you get your badge. Right. So it's like an ongoing right. thing o- over the course of about, of about four years. Right. Interesting. But, no, but yeah, interesting. You, but yeah, still enjoy it. But obviously, you know, uh, as, as we say, we're in the middle of this kind of coronavirus. So, you know, I've been affected, you've been affected, you know, it's, it's, yeah. affe- it's affected the kind of, you know, the, our industries massively. Yeah, yeah, big time. No, everything, it's affected everything. Yeah. yeah, but listen, as you said, as you say, Nikki, we've got to remain focused, we've got to remain positive, and we're going to get, we're going to get back on track. I don't know when, but we'll do it. Yeah, definitely. No, without a doubt, definitely. But listen, mate, absolute honour for you to uh, come forward. You know, we're going to take it back to the start, back to the root, back to where it all kind of started for you. <laughs> so I'm really, uh, really interested. Uh, you know, I'm really excited to talk to you. Because, you know, uh, as I say, you know, you're, you're kind of like live and breathe music. So, yeah, I can't, can't wait to have a chat. An old, an old school chinwag. Wicked. So, um, right. so, so first, <laughs> let, let, let's do this. So, first two questions I always ask is, you know, whereabouts are you from, and what was it like growing up as a youngster? I grew up in between two areas. I grew up in between Marylebone and Kennington. Oh, right. Uh, Marylebone and Kennington. Yourself? Where did you grow up? I uh, South East London. So, I, I grew up in Cholton, but all my family were from New Cross and Deptford. Okay, right. Okay, so. Um, when I was very small, Marylebone, there used to be a, a small working class uh, community in Marylebone. So when I when I tell people now, when I tell people, yeah, I, I was I was I, I was brought up in Marylebone, they think I was born with a silver spoon in my mouth. It wasn't like that back in the day. No. Like I say, it was a small working class community. Um, around Marylebone and then um, my mum moved to Kennington but my nan still lived in Marylebone so I had best of both places yeah yeah so I in between both I, I, I went in between both and um, I, I, had, I must admit I had a big influence with music from my mum God rest her soul um, she loved jazz she was a jazz dancer she knew uh, jazz or jazz people um, and used to jazz, used to go uh, dancing in uh, jazz clubs, and I think she had a big influence of of me in in the music thing. And did she did, just, did she? You know, um, uh, sorry, Nikki. What did, did 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 she? Was she also like a? Did she get into that mod scene as well? No, no, no. She was before that. She was before that. So um, 
she was yeah she was like 100 percent jazz so she used to she knew ronnie scott before he had his club she used to go to a club in soho called uh, 51 club um i think we're talking like 50s 50s probably 50s 60s um and just yeah that's it <laughs> i suppose that's how it all yeah that will kind of come about yeah so you you was basically uh, your mum was a massive inspiration to you when it comes to the music big time yeah big time yeah and it's funny uh, because listen listen you know when you're growing up and you're a little kid and you're hearing you know i was listening to jazz music and not even realizing i'm I'd like oh what's that what's that not not realizing but when you mature and you get older you know it, it, it tends to to grab you, you know, you mature with the music. 100%. And it's quite funny that you, uh, not funny, but you know, I was the same as you. My mum and dad were like mods of the late 50s and the 60s. So I was growing up on a lot of that kind of R&B and Motown, a little, little bit of kind of uh, rock steady and ska music and all that as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so they... So, yeah. so you know, your parents, without a doubt, are, yeah. are a big are a big inf inspiration when it comes to you know uh, you as you're growing up without without a shadow of a doubt. Yeah, yeah. most definitely. And like we were saying about, um, I first I first I started buying records uh, from Groove Records mm. back in the day, and there was a, an old lady in there called Jean. Yeah, Le legendary. And she Jean, yeah. she knew. She knew her stuff. Big, she absolutely knew her. And, it, and it, it's funny because um, I don't know if you remember a DJ called Chris Simon. I don't actually, know. Well, he, he, he used to work in there. Mm. And I literally spoke to him literally the other day. Wow. And I didn't realise I didn't realise that he worked there. No. It, it, was, it was kind of mad. It was a kind of mad discussion that we had. But he, was, he used to be on Pulse FM with me as well. But it got about... Um, that he used to work in there part time, and we, we got onto funny how we got onto that topic, and yeah, Groove Records used to be. Um, I was what I was like fifteen. I must have been about fifteen, and and um, it was when the electro, the electro funk was was uh, was massive. Well, I was going to say, say, Nicky, you know, for, for one, Groove Records was an absolutely legendary record shop. I mean, like you, I used to go in there in the early 80s around probably like 82 or 83 around then. But, you know, yeah. Like, yeah. like you'd walk in there, you know, Jean would be in it. And Jean was basically, it was she was like, like your mum, but, but she knew so much about music. She was like She's so, so switched up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, so knowledgeable. And remember, there weren't no internet back then. That was the internet. It was the hub, the base. You'd go in there. Anything that was, you know, I remember waiting there for tunes to actually come in from the distributor. You know, it's just yeah, yeah, crazy. yeah. And, and, and the funniest thing is, is that they did keep some of the quality tunes behind the counter for like the bigger DJ. So it's quite difficult to sometimes get all the, the, the fresh vinyl because some of that vinyl was held back. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you had to become a regular, just like when, when, yeah. I, when, I, yeah. went to the shop, when I went to, into my shop and you looked after certain people. Of and course. You had to be regular to pull out those certain tunes or you'd save certain tunes for the bigger DJs. Of course. But, you know, I mean, uh, uh, moving forward a bit in Black Market, what we did was, uh, we was probably uh, mail outs. We, you know, people would come with, let's say, they'd, they'd drop a tune in, we'd play it on the deck. And remember, to begin with, we didn't have loads of decks across the counter. It wasn't like that back in the day. It was the main turntable that you had and everyone would stand in and, and listen and, and you'd play the tune and it would be like be like shuffling cards. It's just like you play play the tune and did it oh, I love one of them, I love one of them. <laughs> you could sell you could sell twenty tunes in like that in a split second. Yeah, Crazy, yeah, yeah. But you know, like someone would bring in, you know, they'd have a box of the records, uh, they'd, they'd give us the tune to listen to, brand spanking new white label tune. Play it on the on the set, and and I'm think right, that's a banger. Go over to the guy. Come over here, mate. Come over here, mate. Right. Um, how many have you got? <laughs> and he'd say, 
<laughs> and he'd say, well, I've only got 200. I said, mate, we'll take the lot. We'll take the lot. He's like, really? Yeah? Yeah, we'll take the lot. Give us the lot. And sometimes we worked out a deal. Sometimes we had to pay them cash there and then. It was, you know, just how we sorted out the deal. But, you know, and we'd have them tunes and we'd have the whole lot. But then, and then it come about of the mail out. So um, they'd say, oh, um, does Groove Rider and Fabio and Frost and Brian and um, Rap and Randall and, you know, do they come in the shop? Yeah, yeah. Can, can we leave a copy there for for them? So, <clears throat> and that's how the mail out thing come about with us. That we we you know we got the tunes, got the tunes in, and um, we we get the tunes straight to them from the shop. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah. Great times. You know, that's yeah, the, so that's we help, we help promotion. We will help with the promotion as well. You know, so and, and that's that's yeah. the way that's the way it's kind of always works. So go going going back to Groove Records. Can you give me some of the uh, you know some of those early electro tracks you were buying from there that, that kind of blew oh, your? <laughs> 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 that, I mean, there's, there were some key ones in it. I mean, there's things, things so like many. Patch- there were so yeah. many. All I remember, um, uh, you know, you had Tommy Boy label, you had um, cutting cutting records from New York. You had uh, Al and the Fish. It's um, time. Remember it's that? time. It's time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, about things. About and, things like Pack 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 Jam and Scorpio, Grandmaster Flash and the Furious. Yeah, Pack Pack Jam. Pack Jam's, uh, uh, of course, Grandmaster Flash, of course. Um, and 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 going and then just thinking about Herbie Hancock now because mm. R- Rocket and all that. Because he was before that, he was a jazz guy. So mm. I used to listen. to my mum playing his stuff, the jazz kind of gear. And then he come up with this rocket. Mm. And it was like, at that time there, I went to, I went to Hammersmith to see him play live. And I, even to this day, was the best concert I've ever been to. It was uh, Herbie Hancock, Grand Mix of DST. The DST, yeah. And, 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 and Bernard Fowler, the, the gospel singer. Mm. That was probably the best, one of the best concerts I've ever seen. And you had all the, the legs going from the from the yeah. video, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. Video. legs going on the stage, and that was incredible. That and was, Grand yeah. Grand Mixer, <clears throat> Grand Mixer DST was an absolute beast on the decks with, with his screeching as well. And he, when he was he doing was wicked, yeah. yeah. And that was, you know, that that was that was all new at that point. There, it was. You had, you know, band. You had Herbie Hancock, you know, on on the keyboards, and 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 then. Um, they see on the scratching and yeah, it, yeah, it was fresh. It was amazing, it amazing. Blew, blew your mind away. Uh, yeah. Nick, Nicky, Nicky, did you um, you know, obviously you was into that ele- early electro and early hip hop sound. Did you did you also bust a few uh, like body popping and breaking or, or a bit of graph? I, I used to do a little body popping, a little bit of body popping. Yeah, I used to love it. I used to love it. I, I, I did it with my kids the other day. They were like, Dad, wow. <laughs> <laughs> you know you could do that. <laughs> yeah, like trying to do the wave. Yeah. That's, uh, that's, that's brilliant. But, they, you know, they, they, the thing the thing about it, Nicky, was back then, it was all so new, but it was growing pretty quick. So, you know, uh, things like the Buffalo Girls uh, track and the video to the Buffalo Girls and, you know, uh, films like Wild Style and, you know, the, the scene was kind of getting bigger and bigger. Yeah, I mean, th- that, that point there, I remember there, there's... A, <laughs> I remember... Uh, there was a roadie that used to work for the Sex Pistols and I mean I was really I was little at the time and I remember um, I remember him saying he he went over to to New York and he came back and he said he said listen mark my words there's going to be a complete shift and change the whole music thing's going to change and that stuck with me and basically you know, dance music exploded, and you know that was it. it was just a, that 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 chat that I had with him was just like, yeah, yeah, no, it really. lodged in there that what he said. It's like, no, it blew it blew up massively. Can you uh, can you remember some of like the early uh, sort of UK hip hop you was listening to as well? Was you listening to like Nutriment, London Bridges Falling Down, and 
Definitely, yeah. Yeah, nutriment. Um, oh gosh. And then obviously a little bit... Blade. Blade. blade oh, Blade, uh, yeah. Yeah, Blade. Blade's yeah. a friend of mine. Yeah. yeah. And it's, uh, it's, about like... like foundation. Yeah. About hi, hi, Hijack, a London Posse, Demon Boy. Yeah, London, yeah, London Posse, Rodney, mm. Bionic, you know, the foundation, foundation of... And, and I think, especially that, <clears throat> that UK hip-hop thing, Mm. The UK hip hop thing was instrumental with the whole. Um, how can I say? It? Even the to, to the early rave thing. It yeah. was that very, 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 very important. Because you had tracks like, say, Style Wars and Style Wars by Hijack. It was kind of like quite fast paced. So, so yeah. you, you know, then yeah, then breaks. Yeah. yeah. And and yeah. and obviously also, you know, Ragged Twins as well when they. When they was dropping their stuff as all the Ragga Twins was a uh, and all that, sh sh yeah. yeah, all that shop and dance label stuff, you know, Green Man and all that kind of stuff was was mind blowing. Yeah, it, that's that was the that's, you know pre, you could say pre jungle, you know, yeah. leading up to leading up to really what's going on now, you know, massive. Oh, definitely, and also uh, was it Renegade Soundwave and uh, Sweet Sensation and um, our Depth Charge? Do you remember Depth Charge as well? Yeah, yeah, uh, Vinyl Solution, Def yeah. definitely. Yeah, that Those was a breaks of that. Oh, yeah. I mean, but it's even you know what was funny. I, I went in the shop in into my shop. I went in there in 1990, mm. and uh, at that point there, it's probably just slightly before that. Um, I remember uh, it's funny because you're doing things semi-consciously not even uh, unknowingly it's like so you had you know <laughs> you had like uh, the, the house music and the acid house music at the time and I remember just like unknowingly pitching it up pitching it up yeah 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 so yeah speeding had, it up yeah you know, so you got you got you know the, the likes of the, the, in my field you know, coming in and I'm pitching up and going, yeah, yeah, that, I like that. That sounds good like that. And then you had other people, you know, you had other DJs like the house DJs, the real house DJs. Going, what, what, what on earth are you doing? What are you doing that for? What are you thinking? I'm ruining it, ruining it. But, you know, pitching it up, already going on another path as it was. Does that make sense? Already going on another path un unknowingly. Yeah. No, hundred percent. Listen, we we used to do that as well. Like I, I used to do that with a uh, depth charge. Depth charge was quite slow, but I used to pitch that right up, and it like it used to like be popping off. Yeah, and that's what you used to do: pitch up the the the, the things. It's crazy. It's to totally crazy. And was um you know going back to uh you know the early years of say the pirate radio. I mean pirate radio stations were were pivotal with pirate the scene. Radio absolutely important very Massive, yeah. very 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 important to our scene 100 yeah, the modern day internet exactly That's modern day internet so yeah you had internet. so you had uh you had uh pirate stations like jfm invicta then a bit later you had lwr a bit later than that kiss fm and then you had like uh, the center force the sunrise you know all them all them uh, brilliant pirate that, that stations. that was the next that was the next lot of 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 pirate stations yeah the, the horizon um uh sunrise um center force yeah friends fm um cool fm wasn't it that, cool and then and then the next lot then the next lot um yeah pulse fm weekend rush cool fm that was then the next lot but it was, you know, uh, so important to the whole music thing was because the ma the majors weren't 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 touching it. Major record, um, the major radio stations weren't dealing with it. Hundred so percent. DIY just had to do DIY, and um, it, you know, from promoting the music itself. And then promoting the events where you could hear the music, important, very, very, very important. 
Well, it was, you know, pirate stations were pivotal because, the, as, you, as you said, there was no internet back then or there's no mobile phones back then. So you couldn't say, so basically you tune in to the pirate radio station. For one, you'd get all the, the brilliant music that was being played that wasn't being played on the, uh, the ma major radio the stations. Yeah. yeah, but also... Right. All they also they was promoting, you know, the clubs in the early days, and then in the later years, like the raves, like you know, meeting up on the M25 junction, whatever, and you'd be like having it in a field. There's one time I remember. I've got to say, um, <laughs> <laughs> listen, <laughs> Nick, Nicky, be careful, be careful, because uh, we've got to be careful what we say on it, because this is going out to the, you know, around the world. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Two years ago now, so I was on Friends FM, uh, got a big up Mad B, Roy B that um, run Friends FM. Um, it, I was on there and it was um, it was on a weekend and I was it was at night time and, um, and it, I had to give location, uh, like meeting point. And I gave the meeting point and it was the wrong meeting point and I, <laughs> and I and I I literally because I'd sent everybody to this meeting I was on the radio I was, meet there meet there and I literally jammed up like a turn off or turn on to the M25 that, <laughs> and I off, you gotta change you gotta change, change the thing quickly <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> that's brilliant looking back on it crazy oh Nicky but, that's that's brilliant you know, and uh, you know, and then I remember going on. I remember going up Pulse FM when it was the, the hardcore days, and I remember going up there, and we were just ever so scared that if if we got if if the studio actually got took, that you could go to prison for. At that time, the DTI, the Department of Trade of Industry, mm. were very very hardcore on the radio station. They didn't mess about, uh, did they? No, but I mean, it's like, we weren't doing anything. We weren't doing, you know, it weren't nothing, nothing political. It wasn't nothing. It was just about the music. Just playing but the love. They yeah. it, they, for the love of the music. And they seen it as, uh, well, you're doing something illegal. That's it, you know? So uh, it was, although at the time it was, it was all micro needs. So it, 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 it very seldom would you have your studio, the actual studio taken. So all I remember one point is um, we got took off the air and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> and we, had, we had, you know, we had a certain thing of what to do. Just take all the ads down, take the, the, the cassettes with the ads, put them in your bag, go, gone. You know, so we had to take, so remember, the, all cut off and I was just like taking everything putting everything in the bag running down the stairs um, running down I don't know probably about 15 flights of stairs and absolutely knackered knackered by the time <laughs> I got down to the bottom but you know the heart's going doo -doo 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 -doo. Yeah, yeah. but um, it, it, thank the lord I, I never got caught or anything but it was some people did um and it, it was it was a frightening it was a real frightening thing that um what would you do what would you say if you got caught it's just it, it's scary but we did this because we loved the music so much and you wanted to push out you know you wanted to push out those 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 quality tunes out there and the thing is like nowadays you get like digital uh, digital radio so you know, it's all so different now. But yeah, back then it was totally different, wasn't it? Everything was FM. Um, it was, you know, a, a people would come to London. People would come just you spend a weekend or whatever and, and, and record it. Record the sessions that are going on. <laughs> yeah, great. yeah. Big, big time. I, re I remember like with my with my radio, like with the big antenna, and I'd be like walking around trying to get a signal so that I could get a decent signal to pick up like, you know, like JFM or a bit later, like LWR. Yep. Yep. And that, that was, that's, that, that was what it was all about. <clears throat> Paul's pushing. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Paul's, Paul's, Paul's mixtapes. And, um, 
talk, talking of um, going back to the DJ side of things, uh, Nikki, what, uh, what was your kind of your first setup? You know, your first decks and mixer and all that. I had, um, I did have, I had, I did have a pair of Technics when I was young. I did oh. have, a, um, I did have, a, but I remember before that I had belt driven. Um, I started on the belt driven thing, so you, you know, you, you're going around like this, which. Um, it was, it, it, but, but at the end of the day, it was how you learn. It was that you, how you learn to, you know, how you learn to do it. You were, you was learning your craft. And did you, um, yeah. did you also um, make your own slip mats? Because before you could buy slip mats, we used to make them out of cardboard with a bit of um, a vinyl sheet on top, so you get that slip. Was you making your own yeah. slip mats? Yeah, I used to cut, cut, cut out a thing and put them on there, and then you used to put, especially if you were if you were doing any scratching, you put the Rizzler in the middle. <laughs> and, uh, in the middle. That's what you did. <laughs> stop it skating. Just stop yeah. it skating. Yeah. That's, that's brilliant. What I'm putting like the one P on top of the needle. All of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Depending where you where you where you were, or what you know, if you played on a different set, and you just had to you had to gauge it as as you were going along. Yeah, a hundred, hundred percent. And it is, you know, it's basically that is what you know. It made everyone, you know, you you was learning your craft. Yeah, yeah. And like I say, it, you'd, I think you would, um, especially then because you, you, you'd as you were going along, you'd learning as you were going along, you know. And then it would be uh, um, certain places you play, and the mono wouldn't be very good, or the needle like you say the needle was skating and you'd have to change the arm or change them put the penny on the needle on, <laughs> on the top of the needle or you know whatever you had to do the improvise you know improvisation oh without without a shadow of a doubt and and also uh nikki what, what, who, what djs was you rating back then i mean was you watching like the like the uh the, the, the proper kind of like DMC DJs like Cutmaster Swift and DJ Pogo and all them guys. Oh yeah, I mean all, all of them. I'd say you know uh, all of them were, were they had their own their own cup of tea going on. Big and, time. Um, it's and there weren't no. It was different back then because you had to do it. You done it. You know it was raw mm. and it was. Um, I remember going to the Royal Albert Hall um, for the for the final. Um, I don't know who won it. That was, was it, it cash, cash money. Cash money. It might have been it was cash money or cheese. Yeah. One of I think, it's, I think it's cash no. money. Yeah, cash money. I think you're right there. Cash money. Because I I, I I I interviewed Cash Money the other day and we spoke about that. And do you know what? In Cash Money set at that DMC at the Albert Hall, do you know his monitors had given out at the back so he couldn't properly hear himself cutting up at the first kind of minute or so in his routine. Well, then that, again, you have to use improvisation, you know, yeah. and it's, that, that's a sign of a, of a great DJ. The, the, the sense, the sense takes over, you know. <laughs> the sixth sense, without a doubt. And, and Nikki, can you tell me about some of like the early clubs you was going to back in, I suppose, like, you, you know, like the early 80s to the mid 80s? Um, I remember going. I remember going to, um, and I was young then. I remember going to Lyceum. They used to do Sundays. They used to do um, like Sunday all dayers, and they had uh, Big Steve Walsh, God rest his soul. Um, the 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 JFM DJs. Um, yeah, yeah, because like. Pretty, uh, because Lyceum, Lyceum, for anyone watching, Lyceum is a theatre. But during the daytimes, they used to open up the theatre and have like these all dayers, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. No, they were great. They were great. Mm. I mean, it was, I, 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 when I first, the first time I went there, I thought, I'm not going to get in. I'm not going to get in. And I, I, I think I was underage as well. And it's like, I'm not going to get in. I'm, they're going to turn me away. And I, and I, <laughs> I managed to get in. I was like, wait! <laughs> <laughs> Let's have it. Yeah. But that, that must, great. that must have been in, that must have been in the days, you know, obviously with the soul music and some of the early hip hop stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That was, yeah. We're looking at early, early to mid eighties. 
yeah, early to mid eighties. It's incredible time, but it's um, it's funny when you look back on it and how long ago it really was. No, I know, <laughs> I, no, I know, mate. It's a, it's a long time ago. And did um, was you also obviously you was you was clubbing around say eighty six, eighty seven, and eight, eighty eight. Was you going to like the Wag Club, uh, special branch, do at the zoos, uh, Westworld parties? Uh, the mud club was you going to all that delirium delirium yeah yeah Yeah. i used to go delirium a lot in their story that was and then the mud club um mud club made me laugh because that was uh, that was different because they used to have um and this that was in busby's yeah which was next door to astoria and i remember going in there and they used to have used to have actors with props so you'd have a thing, you'd have a theme of it. You'd have like one week, one weekend, you'd have um, one, one weekend, you'd have like the Western, everything would be Western. And then there'd be someone doing a, a shootout while you're walking by to the bar. On your, you know? on your, on your red, you'd kind have, of red stripe, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then well, the, the next week you might have, um, the following week you might have the Roman looking place you know like a roman scene yeah, and everyone, yeah. you know the actors were going around in robes and then they'd stab each other like the, the, the with their uh, fake swords yeah 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 <laughs> crazy man man like those, those clubbing days are brilliant and you know uh, a lot of the fashion wise it was like freak fra- fra- fashion because like we used to like be rocking like flares with like name belts and um you know and everyone would be wearing like the flight jackets and all that it was brilliant that's how it was crazy that's how it was another place what was that other place um in russell square i don't know if you remember that place there was something in in russell square cj oh, mcintosh you down there. there was one down the top down the top of the court road called the, the uh raw raw yeah i used to play there in the in the mid 90s when it was uh thunder and joy right that was, that was a great club on a sunday night that was good when no, I, so I that, in, that, in the mid '90s, that was when the, the jungle explosion really blew up. Off. And um, yeah, Thunder and Joy used to be uh, Lee and George that used to run that. And um, yeah, Sunday evening, early Sunday evening, went through early hours to Monday morning, and you'd think like everybody would be out the whole weekend. They'd be out like the, maybe the Thursday, the Friday, the Saturday. Now this is the Sunday, and they're still raving it out, and they got to go work on Monday morning. Yeah, and we it's and incredible. We, and and <laughs> we we done it as well, didn't we? We'd have, we'd we'd have maybe like two or three hours sleep, and then go straight to work that on, was on, on the Monday. I, yeah. When I look back on it, I'm thinking, wow, did we really do all that? It's crazy. Yeah, that's, it's, I'd, I'd I'd be going in the record shop uh, the Monday morning, you know, like 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 this, you know, but. That's what we did, and it was it was fun. It was it was just fun. It didn't really, it wasn't, um, you know, it it was real fun. It's just 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 what we loved, you know. We were just absolutely. It was just like an adrenaline rush, and you know, say like eighty seven. You obviously had the acid house, and you had clubs like Trip and all that. And then obviously eighty eight and eighty nine were like kind of really kind of pivotal years when it comes to like you know house music because eighty eight and eighty nine it was really kind of popping off. Yeah, I mean uh, that that was the yeah summer of love, um, the real explosion of. Of the rave thing, um, and it was it, it just leading on to like what you know what I'm doing still today. That was the real big explosion to to what we're doing now. Oh, big time, yeah. And uh, Nikki, can you remember some of them clubs you was going to in eighty eight, eighty nine? Was you going like Echoes down the Lee Bridge Road and like a Spectrum and Land of Oz? Yeah, Spectrum, Land of Oz. Um, and then I used to do, I used to do uh, my own little parties. Uh, me and Clarky used to play. Um, Clarky that used to work in the shop, and and uh, one of Goldie's residents for Metalheads. We used to do our own little parties, um, packed houses. We used to like string up the whole thing, um, play all night. We'd play the whole night. We'd play, you know, we'd string up about I don't know, like eight, eight, eight or something. And then we'd go right through probably till the next morning, till next 
eight o'clock in the morning. And then we'd unstring again. And we'd, we'd get drunk and then we'd drink ourselves sober. <laughs> it was incredible. Yeah. But yeah, me, me and Clark, he used to play the whole night. And that was, yeah, that was, I think that was part of our, probably part of our learning process, I reckon you could say. Oh, big, big, yeah, big time. And um, what what was it? How did you get into working in, a, you know, in Black Market Records? Well, I'd, I'd, I went in as a business partner in 1990. And um, obviously a lot different back then. You know, I, I, I worked upstairs, the counter upstairs. And like I said before to you, you know, we started to go already. Well, as soon as I went into the shop, was we, I was already going on another path. You know, so we decided, uh, 92, it must have been, early 92, we decided to put the, the as it was then, I suppose, hardcore, put that downstairs. We put it downstairs and the rest is history. You know, we got, we pulled Ray in from City Sounds um, at the time and it, that was it. And it, and it it blew up, yeah. And um, you know, working in black market, you know, uh, it must have been like the best job in the world. I mean, it must have been like a like a it twenty twenty yeah, twenty twenty four hour rave. Yeah. It must have been a constant rave it, in there, you know. It didn't, you know what? It didn't matter. You know, <laughs> I remember doing maybe going out at night, doing three or four parties, literally going home, having a shower, and going to work all day in the shop. It wasn't a job. No, it wasn't a job. The shop. Okay, there was business aspects to it, but it wasn't. It, you know, it was my own thing, and it. it I didn't see it as a job. It was real fun. Couldn't have any. You know, I'd be lying to you if I said I didn't miss it. Do you know what I mean? I was in there twenty four, nearly maybe nearly twenty five years, and it was like um, second home. You know, it, it just. It was just so nice supplying music to people giving people enjoyment and people even used to come into us people used to even come into us and um tell them tell, tell us about their problems and 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 then i just thought one day i was thinking but i'm not a shrink i'm not a shrink <laughs> but, <laughs> but people would want to open up and and then we'd, we'd give our views or give our thing you know just to help people and help people get to where they need to get to and it's that to me is the, the, the biggest thing you could get ah oh, big time yeah i mean we get that in the back of our cabs you know people tell us a lot of their problems and you know what's oh, yeah. what, what's Same said in the, yeah. yeah and what's yeah. said what's said in the cab stays in the cab stays there, stays yeah. there. yeah yeah yeah. Right. yeah and um and Nick, it must have like basically working in the shop. It must have opened up quite a few doors for you as well. You know, meeting maybe some promoters or other DJs. Everything, everything it all happened in, when I went in the shop. Definitely, definitely. And it's like, yeah, like um, record labels, promoters, A and R people, um, the whole scene. Uh, again, like modern day internet. That's what it was like. You know and uh, um, uh, artists and just every, every everybody coming in and and it was the flagship for the scene you know uh, wonderful and, and what we got to say about music especially kind of like house house music is because back in the 70s and 80s you know london was a very different place but when house music come come in you know it brought a lot of like unity together and you know um Going to the going to like you know the early kind of jams and the raves and all that it was it was amazing and everybody you know was united as one under one roof. Yeah, everybody would it's it's like escapism for everybody and everyone would just lose themselves in there, forget their problems, forget you know come in, come into either the dance or come into my shop and just forget about all their problems. And then to enjoy themselves, and it was it was a, a place of just sanctuary, you know, like just a sanctuary. It, it was it was like a ch like a church, like a religious experience, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah, 
Yeah. And, uh, you know, how, how does it feel to, um, you know, be DJing in front of a crowd when it's kind of, when it's really going off? Does it, did you get, do you get like goosebumps on your arms? You're like, wow, like everyone's still, going crazy. Still, still, still get goosebumps. Still absolutely get, you know, still get goosebumps. It's like um, the other day we had, um, we done a special stream for uh, Stevie Hyper D, God rest his soul. Uh, it was 22 years that he passed away. And, you know, that, that his legacy of his, you know, that he, um, with the whole MC thing, that he helped that um, influence so many people, you know, and, it, and, and, and I mean, he was my MC. You know, and it's just incredible to see, diff you know, all the different things. Just like I said, like a branch of, you know, like you got a stump of the tree, and then another branch, and then another, another branch, and just to know that you're you're involved in that, it's just it's incredible. A big big R.I.P. to Stevie Hyper D as well. Big R.I.P. Uh, how how did you and Stevie meet? Well, it was, uh, as I said before, about thunder and joy. We, we bucked up there and from, from the off, it was like, boom, you know, we, we, we hit immediately. There's a spark there and we went on road together. That was it. It was, you know, it's, just, it's great. We're just enjoying it. We're having fun. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, without a doubt. And um, Nikki, what's what's the most amount of um, sets you've played like in a twenty-four hour slot? Have you like gone from one party to the next? Have you? Have you I think I did. I did nine gigs. And so some people call me Nikki Nine Jobs. <laughs> Nikki Nikki Nine Jobs. <laughs> and, and I did do nine. I did do nine. And this was in. I'm sure it was between the hardcore and jungle era where um, I started, and it was, I'm sure it was one New Year's Eve. I started early, like kind of early afternoon. It went on to like the next like New Year's Day. Uh, yeah, nine gigs. Yeah, wow, crazy. that's, 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 in, that's, that's incredible, wasn't it? It's, it was fun, it was fun. And, then, and you realize, you think, have I, have I really done all that? <laughs> <laughs> Because it's, you know, when, 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 when I was, um, you know, when, oh, well, I mean, it's still up to before this Corona thing, it's like, you know, people that don't know what goes on, you know, outside of the scene and that you say to them, oh, they said, oh, where are you going this weekend? I said, oh, tonight I'm doing da, da, blah, 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 blah. And they said, what, what all this weekend? I said, no, tonight, just tonight. And there's no, you're not, no, you're not. They don't believe you. Some people, you know, they're not in the scene, don't really understand or realise, they don't understand the whole ethics, the whole thing about it. They think, oh, what, you got that the whole weekend? No, 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 just this evening. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, and also, you know, with the DJ, you know, your weekends, obviously, that's probably your busiest time, so you probably don't really get, like, much of a weekend with your family and all that. Oh, I, 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 I still try. I still try. Um, and... I take the kids to, to well before the corona thing take the kids to qpr um still go and watch the football if i can um and, and yeah i mean the family family time is, is important um yeah at some some time don't get any sleep at the weekend but that's obviously that's how it goes sometimes yeah of course and you you, you take it when you when you can yeah at the work yeah and um Nikki, can you tell me about you know some of the uh, some of the tracks that you've you know you've produced and some of the artists you've worked with? Oh gosh, um, the first tune I, I, I did was with um, on Reinforced Spam EP. This was ninety two, and um, I had Digo from Four Hero Engineer, and he's an incredible, wicked. yeah, wicked, incredible, incredible, incredible engineer. And I remember going up to Dollis Hill, um, just next door, it was Jumbo Studios, which is right next to Dollis Hill Station. And um, I remember going, they had, the first studio they had was up in the attic. And I was just so excited, to, to, to just the whole vibe of going and doing the tune. And, and um, that was, yeah, Spam EP was, a, was my first EP. That was 92. Um, 
just think how long ago it's crazy i know mate it's a, it's a lot it's a long time now isn't it <laughs> it's it, yeah no it's crazy but um yeah i mean nowadays right now i've been doing i've done collabs with with voltage um with aries um with uh clipman outlaw so I'm hopefully once the co um the um corona thing once that kind of um goes out the window that I'll be able to do the collabs get in the studio with the with the peeps again so yeah no 100 percent. and um you know do you still prefer to play vinyl or, or do you use that kind of is it serato nowadays no I mean um, every now and again I'll do a vinyl set that's every now and again but uh mostly I'm on the cdjs now mostly mm. just pop the the usb in and away you go and you haven't got like a big, big box of records that you got to carry about and like not anymore. Do your back. <laughs> <laughs> not anymore. And, and the funny thing is because where we used to cut acetates, we used to cut dub plates uh, back in the day, and that's a thin piece of metal with lacquer over the top. So if you had a box of them, that's 50, 50, 50 keys. That's 50 kilograms, just one of them. So you think you're going around with a couple of them, like. Your, your back's giving you grief. Um, it's not the weekend, but it'll be just after the weekend. So it'll be Monday, Tuesday. Like, oh, oh, you know, you start getting the... Because it's when you... when You you don't realise it, but it's when you're actually lifting them up and putting yeah. them down. Yeah, yeah. It's when... And well, if you're if you're yeah. doing that, if you're doing I that, I don't miss that. Thing. That's one thing I don't miss is the carrying the lugging of the tunes. <laughs> big, big time. But but what, do you, what do you prefer? Do you prefer vinyl or do you prefer you know like an MP3 CD file? I think um, we're living in a different era now. We're living in a different era. You've got to go with the times. Um, it's just another format. That's the way I look at it now. Of course, I love vinyl. The needle on the record, you can't beat that. But uh, things change. And it's just, an, it's just an extra, a different format. That's all it is. Yeah, no, without a doubt. And um, got a couple, few more little questions for you. Um, this is a really tough question. It's one, um, you know, I ask a lot, a lot of people that I interview. Can you kind of give me a selection of tracks throughout the years? It doesn't have to be drum and bass. It could be any styles of music. They kind of, they I really blew your mind. Yeah, I think, let's say, um, you've got, let, I mean, this is an example. I mean, I've got so many tunes that's just, you know, you had... Um, the Future, Noise Factory, uh, Breakage 4, I think it was. I Bring You the Future. You know that one? Um, this was, uh, to me, which was kind of funny because it, it's called I Bring You the Future, but you used to have to pitch the tune down because it was way fast at the time it was like really fast so you'd pitch it down but wow. looking at it now looking at it now that's the kind of speed that that it was made on uh, that's how it was made and we're talking like 93 or wherever is that that blows my mind away that that it was that far behind in time and you had to slow it down but now looking at it it's speed it was made it's, it's now it's crazy when you think about it oh to um, to totally yeah because because really as you said earlier everyone was pitching it up so to get a track that's kind of big that up, so fast you pitched it down you pitched you slow you slew it down wow so that was incredible um oh so many tunes to um how about some of the old soul soul tunes that bit of joyce oh, joyce sims and all that all in all, yeah, all in all, Joyce Sims, Mantronics. Mantronics, yeah, I mean, Man Mantronics was a beast, wasn't it, at producing? Mantronics is yeah. wicked. Big time, big time, big time. Um, all that early hip hop with the breaks. That King of the uh, Beats, King of the Beats. Do, 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 do. There you go, with, with the breaks, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. Incredible. What year was that? 90, uh, 84? 84, no, I, feel, I feel it's a bit later than that. King of the Beats, I think that was around, might have been about 85, 80, 85 86. Right, okay. Yeah, just so many tunes to 
we we we'll leave it there because the thing is I ask people this and it blows their mind you know it's so difficult to give a selection because there's so so many tunes so we we just say there's so many <laughs> <laughs> this is another one that I found interviewing a lot of people uh, Nikki is that basically when I talk to them it's like mu you could say that music kind of saved their life or if they was in if they was down music brought them back up again would you say that music you know helped you get through some tough times music is everything music is everything because uh, of course gets you through tough times gets you through everything it's and obviously like you're saying about you know you you'd hear a certain tune it would make you memorize of something of a certain time or a certain period in your life that was either happy or sorrow or whatever and it would it would click you for a certain moment you know so music was it's so pinnacle to everything, really. And it's, it's as you said before, escapism, enjoyment. It's, it's everything. It's everything. If we didn't have music, it'd be, it'd be curtains. It, it, you know, Nicky, it really is. And, you know, depending on the situation, you know, if you want to be chilled out, you play a bit of whatever, you know, a bit of classical or a bit of like ambient uh, Ibiza type chilled out stuff. Or, you know, if you want a bit, something a bit more hyped, you start playing the banging drum and bass or the jungle or, you know, there's so many different styles. It's everything, wherever you want to go in different, mm. just like I said before about a, a branch, a tree and a branch, and then another branch, and then another branch. And uh, Nikki, how, how can people get in touch with you? You know, can they get, uh, and how can they support your music? Yeah, I mean, I've got uh, my Nikki Black Market fan page um, on Facebook. Um, I've had to create a new one. I, I actually got it hacked. I actually got my um, my old Facebook uh, fan page hacked. So I've got a new one, but it's already up to eight thousand people so far so that's it's going there so on there or either on twitter nikki black market on twitter or on instagram either one of them yeah 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 well nikki what can i say it's been an absolute brilliant chat with you covering you you know your early history and going through all that and um anybody watching watching this interview please press uh, subscribe i've interviewed jumping jack frost i've interviewed the ragga twins public enemy man parish Cosmo D from Nucleus, Willie Estrada, who's a 1970s warlord from the South Bronx. I've interviewed Rodney P, London Posse, Skinny Man. There's too many to name. So please subscribe. And uh, Nicky, what can I say? It's been an absolute honour, my man. And thanks for coming forward Brilliant. to do this. No, thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. It's an interesting talking about the early years really interesting oh uh, without a doubt and i was really excited to talk to you especially about groove records and the electro yeah. stuff because you know i was a big fan of that as well so it's, it's been a real honor my man brilliant thank you for having me all right nicky this, listen all the best mate and listen be lucky brilliant nice one lovely <laughs>